What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the e-commerce influence podcast. My name is Austin Bronner, and I am excited to have you guys here today with someone who I've wanted to interview for quite some time. His name is Cameron Harold. Cameron was the COO of One Eight Hundred Junk, where they grew from I think it was about two million when he got there to well over a hundred million by the time that he left and they and they sold the company. He is a coach. Um, he has a company called the COO Alliance, where he helps second in command. Uh, up their game and be more successful. He's written a bunch of books, including a book called Vivid Vision, which I've read recently and got a lot out of. Uh, We have an awesome conversation. We talk a lot about how he thinks about making decisions, what the pairing of a CEO and a COO should look like, What's the, the, what are the dynamics that will make that role, uh, that combination of people successful. We talk a lot about kind of his vivid vision and how he is uh, embarking on a journey around the world, living globally, selling all his houses, all his stuff in North America and taking years while he continues to run his business and living all around the world. Uh, We talk about kind of systematizing businesses, things you can pick up and learn in your own business. We have a really fascinating conversation and whether you are running a business or you're working in marketing or operations, I think you're going to love this episode. It truly is excellent. Um, So let's dive right in. Welcome Cameron to the show. Uh, Let's kick this thing off. Cameron, welcome to the show. Austin, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I am so excited to have you on the show. I um, I reached out initially because I had a couple people recommend your book Vivid Vision uh, to me, and then I was ha- happened to go down. I was going to go down to Mexico City, and I was kind of doing some planning, and I grabbed your book, and I took it with me on the plane, and I read it. And then I sat down at this nice little coffee shop in Mexico City for a couple of days. And I worked on my vivid vision for my life and for my business. And it was excellent. It was a really good practice. I felt like I walked around a bunch, kind of followed your lead on some of the stuff and walked away with this really practical, wonderful uh, view of my life going forward. Mm -hmm. And so first off, I want to say thank you for that. You're welcome. It's funny that you, I'm glad you mentioned that because you just actually reminded me, I'm, I'm heading down to um, South America tonight and my personal vivid vision expired December 31st, 2021. So I am now five days overdue from getting my 2024 personal vivid vision redone. So tonight on the plane, I'm going to take a look at um, what I need to delete and add and revise. And then I think I'll spend some time down in Santiago this week finalizing mine. So thank you for that. Awesome. Well, yeah. So before we hopped on, you said you were you were taking off tonight, heading down to South America and to Antarctica. Yeah. How did you? Was this something that you've wanted to do for a while? How did you get? Uh, how did you get this in your mind that you're going to go to Antarctica? How did this manifest for you? I've I've been a big traveler my whole life, and Antarctica has been on my list for about 25 years. My grandfather was a really big, big, voracious reader, and um, he was also an entrepreneur. And he gave me a book around 25 years ago called Endurance. And it was about an incredible book. Yeah, spectacular, right? And he said to me it was his favorite book of all time. And he read about three books a week. Um, And most of them nonfiction, like just devoured. Uh, And if if someone who's been reading, you know, thousands of books over his 96 years said that was his favorite book of all time, I was like, I better read this thing. And I was obsessed. I just got completely obsessed with the Antarctic and and with Shackleton's journey. So I wanted to go. And then I thought I'd try to pull together a group of entrepreneurs and um, and organize a trip. I had all the spreadsheets and the numbers and different boats and and uh, was getting ready to start looking at pulling one together for, for even for next year. You need about a 14 year jump to do all the bookings and deposits. And uh, one of my former clients, Yannick Silver, approached me and he said, hey, I'm pulling together a group of CEOs to go to Antarctica. Do you want to come? I was like, yeah. Um, And I said, but it's funny because I've I've been paid now to speak in six continents, 26 countries, but I've never been paid to speak on Antarctica. And he laughed and he said, I will pay you to speak 
in Antarctica when we're down there to the group of CEOs. I'm like, no. So my, my speaking event is going to be, uh, we're on the bottom of the world. The CEO is supposed to be at the bottom of the org chart. Our job is to support the leaders and support the team and support the customers. And we need to flip the org chart upside down instead of being the autocratic, dictatorial, top-down organization. So that's what I'm going to speak about when we're there. Cool. That's, that's, that's awesome. I mean, wait, so first of all, was that in your vivid vision? Uh, to speak Antarctica, on all continents. Yes, it was in my it was in my vivid vision for sure. And my vivid vision for my company expires next year. It was to speak on all continents, so that'll happen. Um, so I've known that it was gonna you know, I was gonna pull this together some way or somehow. I've wanted to do it, so I've been chasing it for a while. It'll also be my fifty seventh country, and I've always wanted to go to more countries than my age. And I'm fifty six this year, so I now get to jump over my age and stay ahead of that curve this year. <laughs> Um, well, that sounds awesome. I, I have had, I also agree if anyone has not read the book endurance, one of my favorite books as well, it was absolutely mind blowing. Some of the challenges, like the reason I enjoyed it so much was that it takes every single challenge that we face and reframes it compared to the challenge of being like stuck in Antarctica for multiple well, years. It's, it's almost become it's almost become a leadership novel, like a leadership uh, lesson or, or a manual. And Steve Jobs actually ranked it as one of his top three books of all times as well recently, like about 10 years ago or 12 years ago. I didn't read it that way. I just read it as a story. And now that I look back at it, yeah, the leadership lessons that come out of it are so applicable for entrepreneurs. So yeah, super jealous. And uh, I think you're gonna have a wonderful, wonderful time. So I, I would love to dive in a little bit and hear when I was going through the book Vivid Vision, um, one of the things I, I was kind of interested in was how did you, wh when did you first kick off this practice? And was there anything in, in particular that inspired you to create a larger vision for your life and for work? And what, what, was, what was that that kicked that off for you? Yeah, so it was actually in 1998, so 24 years ago, I was in Vancouver. I was um, had joined my really first mastermind group, it was called the Entrepreneurs' Organization. I was a member of EO in the Vancouver chapter, it was called YEO back then, the Young Entrepreneurs' Organization. And 120 entrepreneurs were invited to a lunch and the keynote speaker was an Olympic coach and only 20 of us showed up. And the Olympic coach started off the session by saying, I want you to look into the crystal ball and we're like, oh, God, we're never going to get this three hours back. Like, what a waste of our day this is going to be. And it turned out to be one of the most profound business lessons that we've ever learned. And he talked about how high-performance athletes used visualization to see themselves performing in the event. And they would crystallize that vision by playing it over and over in their, over in their mind so often that when they were performing the event, they could do it completely on instinct. And he challenged us to use visualization inside of our business. And we worked on a tool back then that I used inside of my, at that point, it was a private currency company, a barter company, similar to what Bitcoin's doing today, but we did it 30 or 20 odd years ago, sold the company in 2000. And then Brian, who was the founder of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, was also in the same session, and he did one for his company. It was called the Rubbish Boys at the time. And we, we were just kind of, we actually did our first versions in my boardroom at uh, the barter company, and then Brian went to his company, Doc, to write his. But that was the genesis of it, and it worked for me, and it worked for Brian. Two years later, I joined Brian as his COO at what was now called 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and Brian handed me the 2003, what he called the painted picture, what I now call a vivid vision. He handed me his 2003 document. I read it, and I was so clear on what he wanted to do that I knew exactly how to make it happen. You know, I'd built a couple of franchise companies already. He didn't know how to make it come true, but he knew that if I was so clear on his vision, I had the skill set, I could make his vision come true. We nailed it. We crushed the 2003 one. He then handed me the 2006 and he actually walked up to my desk, dropped it on my desk, started laughing and ran away. He goes, I don't know how you're going to pull this one off. And we actually did that one as well. We, we grew the company over six years from 2 million to 106 million in revenue. And that was really the proving point that these things could work. I left that company uh, in 2007, started coaching real companies, typically 50 to 500 employees, but all over the world. And that was really where the genesis of the Vivid Vision concept started. In your experience, I mean, you, you worked as a COO with a, C, with a CEO and went on a tremendous um, growth ride. 
And then also you've worked in a ton of different companies, advising them, consulting, coaching. What has to happen between a COO and a CEO to be successful? Or what do you notice in relationships between the two of them that creates like dynamism and uh, success? That's funny that Austin is from Austin and we were talking about Scribe, who is my, uh, my publishing company. I just signed an agreement with Scribe yesterday to write a book about the CEO COO relationship. And that's really what we're going to be talking about is how to create it and how to, how to find them and bring them on board and create it. So what really has to happen first and foremost is an unbelievable amount of trust between the two individuals. It has to be so completely transparent that you would give each other your bank account information, your passwords to everything, let them take care of your kids, you know, let them travel with your spouse. Like it has to be so trustworthy. The second part is that the CEO has to be very clear on all the stuff they love to do, the stuff that they're great at, the stuff that gives them energy. And they have to be really clear on all the stuff they suck at that drains them of energy. And the COO has to come in and say, I'm really good at all the stuff you hate. And I don't want to do the stuff you're great at. So it's kind of like a divide and conquer. So it's really those two things I think are first and paramount. And then from there, it just becomes almost like the marriage, like a real marriage. It's how do you continue to stay on the same page? How do you continue to build something together? How do you kind of join forces? So that's the shared vision, the shared core values, um, you know, the meeting rhythms, the date nights. It's all those systems that, that really help it. Uh, that's wild. I had no idea that you were in there talking about this. <laughs> this new book, <laughs> but it, it kind of makes sense. Um, so, okay. So when you, when you were working with Brian, what was it that you found to be like, what is your core competency as a COO? What are the things that you love to do that he did not like to do? And what are the things? Yeah. Yeah. In, I'm, in I'm, a bit of a, I'm a bit of an odd duck. So I'm actually very entrepreneurial. I've been running my own companies my whole life. I'd, I'd run, I actually did a talk that's on the main Ted website about raising kids as entrepreneurs. Cause I had about 16 entrepreneurial ventures by the time I left high school. So I'm, I'm very, very entrepreneurial, but I was groomed inside of a franchise organization when I was in my early twenties. And I learned how to operationalize and systemize and simplify every system to make things scale. So I think my my one of my unique abilities is to be able to reverse engineer everything in a very simple way that scales um, so that I don't overcomplicate growth. So I see growth as being very, very simple. I see company growth as being very, very simple. That's one. Number two is I really had a deep understanding of how to build a strong company culture. And I said to Brian on my first couple of days there, we have to turn this company into a magnet for talent because of the growth that we're going to have to do, we need to attract people into the company really, really quickly to fuel that growth. So we have to become a little bit more than a business and a little bit less than a religion. We've got to get into that zone of a cult or that real strong culture. Um, so that was another one. And then I, I didn't really like finance and IT and Brian did. So I ran everything on the operations with the people, the culture, PR, marketing, sales, you know, um, franchise development, all the stuff related to franchising. And Brian just let me do that. And then at one point, Brian even handed me the call center because it just became too big of an operation. So I ran that as well. When you guys were growing so fast and you're talking about acquiring talent, um, what, what changes f in a company do you find like uh, do, do you notice this that there's consistent themes as a company goes from like two to 20 million to 50 million 100 million well, what, what did you notice on your journey and also what you've seen from working with clients around how the company evolves yeah so two things one the first one is that every company goes through the same natural transitions at the ones and threes so when you go from one employee to three Right. It's just you. Now you hire a couple people. Now you can divide and conquer. You got to give responsibility. When you go to 10 employees, you probably have your first manager. And now you need to get stuff done through another person. When you go from 10 to 30, you have your first management team. And now you're managing four or five people who are managing everyone. When you go from 30 to 100, you've got people in the company. You don't know who they are. You've actually got your first leadership team being formed. You've got company politics are creeping in. When you've got 300 people, it's all about strategy and culture and execution and vision and letting people do their jobs and acquiring talent. So that's kind of the natural trajectory. 
Um, and that happens on the revenue numbers too, 100,000, 300,000, a million, 3 million, 10 million, 30 million, 100 million, the same natural hurdles. The one big thing that I think most companies miss on, companies, especially entrepreneurial companies, tend to be very good on the entrepreneur working on their skills. Where the real growth comes is when the entrepreneurs invest in their managers and grow the team, right? If you mm -hmm. grow people and grow their skills, they'll scale your company. So years ago, I was coaching a company. I grow, helped them grow from 40 people to 700 people over six years. And I was coaching their CEO, Bobby, and I was teaching him some stuff around emails. And he said, wow, this is going to change the company. And I'm like, no, this will change you. But what will really change the company is to teach those systems to all of your leaders and all of your managers, because that's how we're going to get scale, right? But when the entrepreneur is just focusing on growing themselves, that's not where scale happens. I actually launched a course earlier last year called Invest in Your Leaders to give the core leadership systems to all managers and leaders. But I think most companies really, really miss on that. For me, I was, wasn't a lazy entrepreneur, but I always built very fast growing companies. I knew that I couldn't be the one doing it, so I had to be really good at skill transfer with all of my team very, very quickly. How did you guys pass information or train people at, at 1-800-JUNK? So, um, so, so this is going back to kind of pre-LMS. We didn't really have a learning management system in place. We actually got, grew one and built one internally. The first thing we did was we focused on almost Simon Sinek's uh, why, how, what. Simon was actually on our board of advisors four years before he wrote the book, Start With Why. So the first thing we grow people or train them on is the why. The core purpose, our core values, our BHAG, our vivid vision, the history of the company, the culture, we train them on that. So everybody's really, really clear on our cultural DNA. The second thing that we train them on is how to be strong leaders and managers. So situational leadership, coaching, delegation, time management, project management, email management, effective meetings, interviewing, you know, all the skills that managers and leaders need, which is actually the core of my Invest in Your Leaders course. We grew them in that. And then we grew them in the what we do. That was all the functional stuff. So that's what we did. The way we approached learning was we realized that everyone learns in a, in a kind of a cycle where they learn the concept or the abstract concept and then they learn by practicing, and that's the act of experimentation. And then they learn by doing, which is the concrete experience. And then they learn by talking about it and reflecting on it. That's the reflective observation. And then they can learn again. So we kept bringing them through this cycle in, in every skill, almost taking them from a bronze to a silver to a gold in every skill. So that was the, uh, the basic approach to learning. And then what we did is we tried to actually bring in visual and auditory and kinesthetic. So we did some video back in the VHS days and, and then it became part of the LMS. We hired a guy from Vancouver Film School who like took the equipment at night and came out and filmed a bunch of stuff and brought it back to the school at night. We paid this kid to do it. And then we wrote a bunch of the material, right? So we, we had a transcriber in Sweden who took a lot of our video stuff and transcribed it for us before Rev.com existed. And then we created pre and post tests and we did a lot of hands-on training. So we got the auditory, the visual, and then the hands-on training. And that's how we bundled, you know, the training together. So it wasn't even so much what we trained them on. It was the methodology and the approach. And I even sure. teach that. I even teach that in the Invest in Your Leaders course is how to actually run classroom training and how to grow people in coaching. And this isn't was this something by, I'm not trying to pitch my course. It's just falling in naturally that this is this is the core stuff that that small, medium sized companies really need. And did you guys start this when you were, what, what's, you said it was, I think, 2 million when you joined, but how, how many people were there when you actually joined the company? Yeah, when I walked in on day one in October of 2000, there were, four, there were 13 people. I was employee number 14, and I started to train the leadership team on this stuff. And then as we scaled, each person I brought in, I trained them on this and we replicated. And then I, put the, I built the initial training systems and the initial training manual. They had 12 franchises when I got there, but they had no training manual and no training system for the 12 franchisees. So I trained, I built those systems to actually train and replicate that system. And I wanted every system to be able to be written on a post-it note. You know, if you can simplify it and you can write it on a post-it note, then we can scale this thing. It has to be so simple that the worst employee in the worst market in the middle of February, right, like a buffalo, in a, in a snowstorm could execute on this system. And that's, again, yeah. the methodology I thought through. Well, so interesting. I, one, my first, the first job I ever 
joined out, out of college was actually working at a franchise. Uh, we were we were the franchisor, and we were selling franchises for healthy vending machines, uh, and we put them in all around the country. It was like during the Let's Move campaign. What was it called? Simply uh, human healthy vending. It was that and two two partners, right? Yes, Sean and Andy. I coached them for a period of about six months. Really? I, I wonder if it was when I was there. Um, it, it was, was and, and it's interesting because I actually, I think the reason they stopped having me coach them was I was really pointing at them saying like, you have to give a shit about the franchisees. And I think they did extraordinarily well, but I really wanted them to obsess about the franchisees success more. And I think I was very in their face about it. And I don't think I knew how to, to soft sell them on it as much, but they did a great job with execution. I, I think that, that, you know, it's funny you, you say that. I, I would not be surprised. That was one of the challenges that we faced uh, during it. But what, one of the things that was interesting that I found was, you know, thinking, what I'm interested in is, is you being in franchise, being a franchisor, working in this. I think one of the things that's interesting about that is the system creating side of creating success for other people. What what do franchisors do well? Or what, what could the average business owner who's not in a franchise type system learn from, from franchises? Well, most franchisors suck. Most franchisors make money because they couldn't make money on their own business so they sell it to a whole bunch of other people and that's how they can make their money the really good franchisors have a franchisee who's making a lot of money and a head office who's making a lot of money and a customer who's doing well and and those are i don't know what it might be the 15 percent of the great franchisors out there i think if you obsess about having really happy employees having really happy franchisees having very profitable franchisees then you can almost charge whatever you want. So I think what most companies need to learn is that same model, right? Really obsessing about yeah. employee engagement and customer engagement. But if you're just focusing on how do I sell more, right? A lot of franchisors are just sell more units, sell more units, sell more units. Well, great. I'm glad you got all your revenues from your franchise fees, but you don't have enough royalty revenue coming in to survive. So then they try to charge more from the franchisees and the franchisees aren't doing well. Horrible model. I had a discussion with Fred DeLuca from Subway Restaurants about 20 years ago, and I said, how do you handle you know, uh, franchisee complaints? He said, oh, litigation. I'm like, wait, what, what, what? Like, you're just gonna sue each other? Like, that's not, that's not a healthy environment. So I, I think what really makes the great franchisors and great businesses is actually caring about the employees and the franchisees, and if you really do, everything scales from there. Sure. I've Do you know, like, like franchisees that I'm still friends with from 20 years ago who, you know, I haven't worked for 1-800-GOT-JUNK in 14, 15 years and I get text messages and email messages from them on a weekly basis. Do you, who's doing it well now? Are you, at, are you at all like paying attention in the market? I'm, I'm not. On the franchising side, I'm not. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to it. Yeah. It's, it's interesting being on the, on the flip side, like all the dynamics is being working that I was like the third employee of that company um, when when I was involved with it, it. Everything you say about like the happy customers, the happy franchisees, like that is such an interesting part of the whole dynamic of running a franchise franchisor that like the, the, you realize once you're in it how there's so many more dynamics at play uh, of many levels of success that have to happen to be able to be like you can grow really fast, but that doesn't mean that everybody wins. Well, it doesn't also mean that you'll sustain that growth. You know, so I, yeah. I was a part of an organization called College Pro Painters, which just finished its 50 year in business. I was chatting with the CEO over email about a week or two ago, and I was a franchisee for them in 1986. I'm kind of dating myself, right? That was 35 years ago. In 1993, I hired Kimball Musk, Elon's brother, to be a franchisee for me. And I also hired Peter Reeve, who went on to build Solar City. He was another franchisee of mine. And when I, when I was a franchisee, the very first meeting I had with them, they said, how much money do you want to make this summer? I was like, I don't know. And I gave them a number and they said, well, what if you made like 50% more than that? Like, wow, that'd be amazing. So he said, well, if you want to make, the, the number was 15,000. If you want to make $15,000 in profit, which is a lot of money in 86, do you know how much revenue you need to do? Nope. Here's how much revenue you need. So they showed me the model to end up with the profit that I needed. They created the, the weekly spreadsheet of things I needed to do to get the revenue so that I'd make that profit. 
they coached me along that and I made that profit. Well, guess what? They also hit the revenue numbers. And by them <clears throat> raising my profit goal, they raised the amount of revenue I needed to do, which meant they made more money. But they weren't focused on them. I mean, they kind of were. But by focusing on me and my happiness and my goals first, theirs came easy. And, and that was their entire business. So that's, I think I got a bit of a cheat sheet because that was just the way I did it. That was the way I've always done it. Sure. That's really, it's interesting because it does flip a little bit of like the model of setting goals, especially right now we're recording this around like the beginning of the year and a lot of people are thinking about goals for their company and uh, whether that's revenue goals, profit goals. It's interesting to think about flipping it around and, and looking down at the bottom and seeing what metrics can we move that really help people support our goals. When I do it with my, uh, as an example, I've got two salespeople right now who sell um, for the COO Alliance, right? I have this mastermind group that no entrepreneurs are allowed to join. It's only for seconding commands. And they're they're 100% commission. One of them will make in his first year about 120,000. The other one will make about 230 in his second year. But I sit down with them and I say, how much money do you want to make this year? How much profit do you want to earn in sales? And they give me the number and then I show them the plan. And then I keep coaching them on the plan. And now they don't, and so they use a CRM and I have never mm-hmm. once logged into their CRM. I don't know how to log into their CRM. <laughs> and, and they're like, well, why are we using a CRM? I'm like, it helps you sell. And they're like, but you're not looking at it. I don't want to. Like, if you want help, ask me, but it's going to help you sell if you track stuff. And you. So they're, they're like all into using the CRM and they're closing a lot of deals because they know I'm just there to help them. Well, guess what? The more I help them, the more they sell, the more, the better I do. Whereas most companies are like, oh, let me see how many calls you've logged and let me see what you're saying to the customer. And then the employee thinks you care more about your goals than theirs. It's just backwards. Which is, uh, which at the end of the day, I think is probably true, right? Like that when you're thinking of it that way, you probably do care more about your success than the employee's success, which yeah. leads to not a great culture. And, and, and so they're right, right? And, and I think... From the same vein, and I learned this from Herb Kelleher from Southwest Airlines, he said if you, that your employees are number one, customers number two, right? If you obsess about your employees being happy, they'll take care of your customer. They'll work nights, they'll work weekends, they'll go through brick walls for you. But if you're so obsessed about the customer being happy, the employee feels overworked and underappreciated, right? It's almost this, okay, so I'm just gonna care so much about my employees, and I know that if I care about them, they'll care about my customers. And then it's easy to go to work every day because you're just having fun helping people. Yeah, I get the powerful reframe. How how do you, how do you stay motivated? I mean, you you've been work. You said 1986. You kind of first kicked this thing off, and you've had a career that has spanned through being an operator, coaching. Um, what what motivates you? It's it's well, it's interesting. You so you just you just asked two slightly different questions there. The first one was how do I stay motivated, and the second one is what mm-hmm. motivates me. The way I stay motivated is I am motivated. And, and I answered this question to Fortune magazine in 2003, which is actually how Simon Sinek and I met. He read the article and came out to Vancouver to meet us. Um, Fortune said, how do you motivate your employees? And I said, I don't motivate employees. I hire motivated people. And then I inspire them with a the vivid vision and then I help them to get there. So, so I just wake up motivated. I'm just a motivated human. So the way I keep myself motivated, though, is by having a new vision of something I'm striving towards, either a vision for a better life or a vision for a better relationship or a vision for a better CO alliance or a vision. For like, so as long as I'm clear on where I'm going and I share that with lots of people, they can help me make that come true. And because I've shared that vision with a lot of people, it makes me feel the pressure of needing to perform because I've told them I'm going to be doing it. So it's just a little bit like that. You mentioned your vision, your vivid vision was expired, just kind just kind of expired here, and you're gonna be working on it for the next uh, over the next couple of days. What was the theme of your vivid vision for yourself over the last three years? Well, a lot of it was being a calmer and more relaxed person with my kids and a lot of self care. Um, but I'll tell you that there's one key part that's going to be changing in here. One of the notes was I consistently balance prioritizing myself, my kids, and my girlfriend. 
Um, well, my new vivid vision is going to be saying that I consistently balance myself, my kids, and my wife because we're getting married in May. So my, my vision is now, now I got a wife, not a girlfriend. And, and we've been together for three and a half years. But when I wrote that one, I wasn't quite sure that this was going to be a forever and I didn't want to commit to the forever. So I just committed to she and I. I committed to doing lots of trips with my kids and self-care. I'm 42 pounds lighter than I was 10 years ago right now. And I'm, you know, I worked out three days in a row. I did six days at yoga when we were in Costa Rica last week. I took 13 weeks off last year of complete vacation time. So I'm really, really focused on that kind of stuff. And my companies keep scaling, you know, the more that I focus on that. Uh, how is it going to change for you this upcoming, in this upcoming three years? The, well, the big change is going to be that I no longer live in North America. I gave back my green card. Um, I'm selling my home in Vancouver, so I'll have no homes in North America. I got rid of both my cars, got rid of my home in Arizona. So now I'm going to have two kids that are in, away at university, and I'm going to have to craft a life where I get to spend time with them when they're not at school, where they are at school, where I'm global. Um, my my fiance and I are planning to live globally. I'm moving my companies and my tax residence to Barbados, but I only have to go there 24 hours a year. So it's a lot of it's going to be how do I visualize this kind of global lifestyle and global travel and, and keeping balanced and fit and happy and connected while living all over the world. So I'm super interested in this. And I want to come back to talking about kids, raising kids as an entrepreneur. I'm having my first child in June. Uh, so I'm it's, it have, weighs heavily on my mind, but I'm interested in this global lifestyle and um, selling houses, selling your base in North America and moving globally. What was the inspiration for that? I just really want to travel. And I'm, I'm, I've had all the stuff. I don't need to have the stuff anymore. You know, I've had the Tesla P90D, like I've, I've had, you know, the Audi Q8s, I've had the chalet at Whistler, I've had the estate with two guest houses in, in you know, Arcadia in Arizona. Like I've had all this stuff and it just weighs on me. All of those things weigh on me. And then I realized like there's a whole big world out there and none of this actually matters. Like at the end of the day, we're going to die. So there's some cool shit to go see. And I don't really know where I want to live, but I know that it wasn't going to be Arizona after 10 years. I like it, but I don't need to stay. And I've been in Vancouver for 27. I don't need, you know, I, I know it well enough now. I kind of want to go explore the world. And um, I've got a, a fiance who kind of wants to do the same and my kids love travel. And so now it's all about how do we find that kind of a balance and, and lifestyle and, and blend it all together. Do you have any places you're going? Like, w w what's your top, three or four places that you're excited about uh, going to live and, and checking out as a home base? Um, yeah, so it's going to be things like Lisbon, Buenos Aires, Barcelona, Amsterdam, Dubai, um, sometime in Barbados. But those are probably what we're thinking of in terms of hubs. We think we may end up with a hub in like a Lisbon or Barcelona, a hub in, in um, Buenos Aires, um, maybe a hub over in kind of like a Dubai so that we have these places that we might own, but we rent out when we're not there, but a hub so that we have some grounding. But the plan is yep. to, um, after this year, which is run a bit of a crazy tear this year with, with hopping a lot next year, it's going to be a lot more of like pick a place for a month and live in that city for a month and then go to the next city and live in that city for a month and, or maybe even two months. And just knowing that we want to get, I want to get into some more routine where I, I know where the yoga studio is. I know where the good coffee shop is. I know where the restaurants are. I've got some friends that I'm meeting in places and, and we can kind of feel a little bit more settled. Um, and then my kids also, you know, so I, I travel with my weird things that I travel with. I have a scale uh, and it's to keep myself accountable for health. So I weigh myself every morning. It fits into my backpack. And we're, by the way, traveling with a backpack and a day pack. Okay. That's literally how little we have. Um, you're seeing me in one of my two dress shirts. And then the other thing that I travel <laughs> with is a, I t travel with a digital picture frame of my kids. So it has their photos cycling through it and I can take it out wherever I am just to remind me and ground me. I love it. Well, so, uh, you, you probably, you don't know, but it's about me, but my wife and I have traveled s substantially and spent like months and years on the road traveling around. And so it's something I'm really passionate about, like lived kind of all over the world, whether it's been in Europe. Southeast Asia, uh, Australia, and it what was so impactful. What was your that? favorite? Where were your favorite places? <clears throat> well, for hubs, places that uh, that I would actually consider to live for 
a consistent amount of time. Um, one of them is actually Portugal and like Lisbon is a wonderful place. Um, the whole, like Portugal is just a wonderful place to live. There's lots of great things. So I, yeah. that one's great. Mexico city is a wonderful place. Uh, Buenos Aires, um, Southeast Asia was really great when I was younger. I, I don't think I'd want to live there as much anymore. Um, Germany, my wife, we went down the rabbit hole of getting multiple passports and uh, she has a German citizenship. So Germany is a place that I would, I would definitely live and move Italy. I actually have a couple clients who live in, um, in Italy right now, in, one in Puglia and one, another one in Sicily. Uh, it's interesting. Their lifestyle is very interesting because they they've kind of like overhauled They've gone from like most, they lived in the UK and then moved there and they do a lot of the same stuff, but it's just at a much slower pace yeah. and well, it's like focused on health and life and, uh, and wonderful, um, experiences. So those are some of the places that, um, definitely very excited about also Cape town. Oh, I haven't been to Cape town yet. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same on Southeast Asia. I was there, um, 30 years ago. I've been back a couple of times since, it's too hard from a from a business perspective because of time zones to do business from there as well. Very I tough. Um, I'm really, really excited to spend some time in Portugal, as is my fiance. We just spent six weeks in Italy. We actually got engaged in uh, in Venice, um, and and yeah, I love the slower pace, but I don't love the two and a half hour dinners. I'd like to be able to get in and out of the restaurant <laughs> a little bit faster. <laughs> so, um, I do, you, do you ever talk? I have a good friend of mine who um, traveled for a year with four kids under eight years old and the longest they stayed in any place was one month or one week and they did an entire year with four kids. So it, it can be done. Is it, is it the same person who wrote the uh, San Francisco fallacy? No, uh, he wrote a book though, something like how to leave home and take your kids with you or something. It was Adam Daly. I can't remember the name of his book, but his name's Adam Daly. It's super interesting. I, I'm like, um, I, one of my best friends has been, he moved everything offshore, lives in Mexico city, uh, and has his business incorporated, I think in like Hong Kong and like every, all his banks in Georgia, uh, and was perpetually in motion for the last four years, five years. And he worked with the guy, uh, the nomad capitalist who you might have found, um, Andrew, who's been on this podcast as well, talking about like the benefits of global citizenship. It's very interesting. Um, and yeah, I'm excited for you. That sounds like a, a lot of uh, fun and going to be very, you know, interesting change. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. I'm, I'm in a different space because I'm Canadian. Um, so Canada doesn't follow you on worldwide income. Um, yeah. But there's, there's still some, some learning I'm trying to do. I actually connected with Andrew at one point and um, just found a different path that was easy with people who had worked with a lot of Canadians. So, but yeah, what I'm trying to figure out now is just, you know, how to have balance and how to have a nice life and how to stay connected with my kids is the big one. That's the real one. I'm still trying to understand because, um, absolutely. We found, we were on the road for, I think it was like three years and we found the longer we were on the road, the slower we moved. It was like, oh, at first it was three weeks and then it was like, oh, now we want to spend two months here. And then it was like everywhere we're going, we're just slower and slower and slower to be able to get more of a, um, get more connected and also just maintain the ability to like keep it going. Yeah. I um, I'm going to be very, I'm already there and, and I would have been much happier to do that. My fiance has a little bit of FOMO and has this, like, I want to see, I want to see, but it's, it's starting to, to really drain her right now. So that's really what we're talking about a lot is how to actually slow that down and realize that we don't have to go everywhere or we could be based in, let's say Barcelona for two months and do every weekend side trip if you want to, or get the fuck out and go away for a week and I'll hang out here or, or let's just go away and leave the house empty for a week or two. Like it doesn't matter. Like it's so little, but I think, I think oh, that's yeah. the we're trying to get to now. We, we would just get an apartment for a couple months, leave all of our stuff there and take backpacks and then go on little weekend trips. And that, yeah. that ended up being a really good balance for us where we got to go explore all the things and then leave our big, our bag and our stuff that we realize, Oh, I don't need all this stuff to go for a weekend yeah. around. 
I think that would make it easier as well as to have that one extra bag of some other stuff that would make life a little simpler versus trying to make it all work in the, the backpack and a day pack. But yeah, the one thing I will share that was my, my favorite thing to carry along if you don't have it is the yeah. roost. I've talked about on this podcast a bunch. It's called the roost stand. It's a stand for your laptop huh. that folds up. The guy's been on the show. It is so helpful. You can throw it in your bag and then everywhere you go, if you need to set up and do some work, you just, it lifts your laptop up. And, um, and I, I would say every single time I've worked in a coffee shop, whenever I've been traveling, somebody comes up to me in like 15 countries being like, what is that? Can I, where can I buy that? Also, another good place to work is, uh, I found Stockholm was a really wonderful place to be able to live and work. Um, and Every internet cafe had like the fastest internet I've ever ever seen, and it's just wonderful to sit there and and um, yeah, that's our, our summer next year is Sweden, Finway, Finland, Norway, and Estonia is all of next summer. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So, okay, on that, do you have any? I'm interested. One of the I'm interested in how you make decisions, um, and as you've progressed throughout your career, how do you? think about decisions now for your life and for your career and how is it different than when you were in your let's say early 30s i think i think the big one is that because i'm so clear on my vision for the next three years for the business and vision for my life that it becomes a really easy filter for things whereas when i was younger you know in my 20s and 30s it was a lot of it was oh, that seems like a good idea, I'll go there. But it wasn't directed with anything. Now I think about it, I'm like, well, so what is, what's my business gonna look like in three years? And then all the opportunities that I stumble across, some of them feel like really good opportunities. Like an example is this course. So I launched this Invest in Your Leaders course and everybody that I was talking to, oh, you have to have cohorts. You know, People have to do the course together. They need to have access to you. There needs to be a Facebook community for the course. I'm like, fuck that. I don't want any of that. I don't want to create more work for myself. I don't want to have to be responsible for all this stuff. I don't want to, f I, I'm friends with Jeff Walker. I don't want to use the product launch formula. I want to have a very profitable course that's self-guided, that just grows, that works, that people are happy with. And we'll do over a million dollars in revenue in the course this year without doing any marketing spend just and everybody's loving it i had one customer in the last 10 months ask for their money back here you go i get like so it's because i'm clear on what i want i understand then how to build that so then i found course people who did something similar and i just kind of are indeed right rip off and duplicate take some of their ideas but it's because i'm very clear on where i'm going you know, I think it's the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland said, if you're not clear on where you're going, any road will take you there. Sure, sure. What happens when things go not according to your vision? How do you deal with that? I lose my shit. Um, <laughs> no, I guess, so that's been a learned skill. Like I, I used to get super stressed and super frustrated. And now I, I often now just say, what's the system that was broken? You know, what's the system that was missing? So I'll give you an example. This morning I was doing an interview for our second in command podcast. It was episode number 198 or something. And I forgot to start recording. I was 21 minutes in. It's the second time in 198 episodes. You look down to make sure we start, right? Um, and I sent my team oh, yeah. a note. I was like, a, a make sure I'm recording. <laughs> yeah. so I sent my team a note. I said, hey, can we get the auto recording set up? Like I have on all my coaching calls, Zoom just starts recording. Can we at least get it started that way so that it never happens again? So instead of me getting upset with me or my team, I just find the missing system or the broken system. And by the way, the second in command for Riverside is a member of our COO Alliance. Well, tell him he's doing a great job. Yeah. They, they um, I mean, for people who are, are, are listening, Riverside is the platform that we use to record video and audio. And it was, um, I, it was funny because I actually tried, reached out to try to buy one of their competitors because it was doing such a terrible job before Riverside launched. There needed to be a Riverside. And this guy, I can't remember the Zencaster, I think is what it was. And I reached out and emailed the guy. I was like, listen, I don't know what's going on, but I would love to buy this company because just the, will you entertain me purchasing this to try to figure out? Because it would just always drop. All these issues would happen. I, I lost like five podcasts. And uh, he was like, no, no, I, we're, we're, there's no option to sell here. We're all in. And then Riverside came in and just blew him out of the water. Yeah, we've done a great job. <laughs> 
really, really um, good job of execution and simplicity. You know, they've done a good job with keeping yes. everything simple. I, mean, I think that's the key. Like <clears throat> business is really, really simple, right? Grandmother, if you listen to all the grandmotherisms, she was right with everything, right? Keep it simple, right? Take care of your customers. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Like all those grandmotherisms are real. People tend to overcomplicate everything for no reason. What happened to you in your, how, how did your career change and how did your relationship with work change when you had kids? Uh, it actually changed the year before I had kids. I had an emotional breakdown, nervous breakdowns because of stress that was all related to work. Um, I was very unhealthy. I weighed 40 pounds heavier than I do today. I was smoking. I was drinking a lot. I wasn't getting exercise. We'd grown the company to 900 people. The stock market crashed. NASDAQ went down by 78% in six months. Um, you know, we had to fire 450 of the 900 people. Like it was just a, a shit show. And I thought I was fine. <clears throat> and I was written up in the Wall Street Journal as one of four people whose careers had gone really high and flamed out with stress. And I, I recognized that I was the cause of that. So I just decided that wasn't going to happen again. Um, unfortunately, a little bit of it did happen in one eight got junk. But most of that was I wasn't happy in my marriage at the time. And I poured myself into work. So I think the big learning came from that first divorce and just understanding what my relationship with work was, my relationship with myself, um, you know, with balance, with, with understanding some of the, the, the signals that my body would send out, like I would taste stress. I could almost have this metallic taste in the back of my neck. So now it's, you know, get a lot more exercise, plan time for myself, take vacation time, spend time with my kids. I don't work after 5.30 any day. I don't work at nights ever. I don't work weekends ever because I'll never catch up. So it wasn't so much kids that got me there as it was a couple of really big stressful events. So you gotta tell me more about that the article, the Wall Street Journal article. Did they reach out to you being like, talk, like how did you get featured in that? Were they talking about you or with you? I don't remember how that one happened. I know that I've known Peter Shankman who started Haro forever, um, but I don't think Haro was around then. I don't remember. Her name was Perry Capel. Why I would remember her name is beyond me, but she reached, I don't remember how she either reached out or it was a long time ago. It was like 22 years ago. I don't remember. I've yeah. been in a lot of, I've been in a lot of media articles. I've been in, in a lot of press and, and I think I know that I'd been in a bunch of press because of the companies that we were building. So maybe it was that I don't, or maybe it was the entrepreneurs organization being connected with that. I don't remember. Yeah. So, so you made this transition and you started to uh, obviously like changed your life and some of the habits that you had, how, once you had kids and, and they started to grow and, um, did, did you find it that it was easier to stay on track with those things because you had a different perspective or did anything change as they, as they grew? And what are some of the things yeah. people should know about building a business while having, while with kids? Well, the reality is the only stuff that matters is your friends and family. Like the business will take care of itself if you if you keep yourself focused and balanced. So I, I put all of my kids' activities into the calendar first. I put their school activities, their two-year-old swimming lessons, their like, you know, four-year-old soccer practices. Like I was at everything, um, you know, our, our ski trips, our family trips, buying the chalet and Whistler. Like I was very omnipresent as a father uh, with my kids and all their activities you know, walking them to school, turning off work at five o'clock, 5.30, so I could play with them and do stuff with them. Like, I just realized at an early age that we're never going to catch up. You know, that to-do list that we're just going to work tonight to catch up. No, tomorrow you'll have another to-do list. The next day you'll have another to-do list. You'll buy a company, you'll spin off a division, you'll make it bigger. So you're never going to catch up. What you're doing is you're lying to yourself. So what I decided to do was delegate more it's interesting, I was coaching this woman, Suzanne Evans, years ago, who she actually runs a big coaching program, and I was coaching her. And something she does amazingly, every Sunday night, she makes a list of all the stuff she has to do for the week. And then she puts the number of hours or minutes beside every single task. And then she adds up the total number of minutes, and she delegates 80% of the minutes to other people before she works on anything. So she's really forcing herself to get stuff done by delegating, by optimizing, by automating, by outsourcing versus I'm going to work harder. I love that. It's really, it, it's a really good way to, to think about it. I was, I was doing that this actually two days ago, but I did not write down 
what I was going to delegate, it all fell on my list, which is <laughs> which is not the ideal situation. No, our, our job as leaders is to be upside down, right? To flip the org chart upside down so we're at the bottom supporting the team, growing the team. Our job is to grow their skills and grow their confidence so that they can do more. And the more we grow our team skills and grow their confidence so they can do more, the less that we have to do, which means the company grows faster. But the more time that we spend doing stuff means that we're actually stunting our company's growth. In your role now, how much time do you actually spend in front of a screen um, working on the computer outside of obviously recording your podcast? Well, so my COO Alliance is all online. Uh, we have two in-person events a year, but all of our events are now online with our members. We have members from 17 countries. My team is completely remote, so I've got team members from everywhere, and we're just all over Zoom. Um, my coaching clients, I coach about a dozen CEOs. I'm trying to bring that back down a little bit to free up some time, but all my coaching clients are over video. Um, and then I manage you know, via Slack and email, so it's all, it's all pretty digital. And then I'm pretty big on social media in terms of being, that being a promotional machine for, for everything. So it's pretty strong. It's pretty, pretty much there. But it's the limited. So when I was in Italy for six weeks, as an example, only one of the six weeks was I on vacation. I worked the other six weeks, but I only worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I only worked from 1 p.m. till 7 p.m. Italy time. So when I had all the mornings to go work out and get some exercise and do sightseeing and have lunch with my fiance. I'd work from one till seven. I'd shower and change. Nobody even opens their restaurants in Italy till seven thirty. Nope. Which Amer Americans would lose their shit. But like, if you go for dinner in, in Italy at nine o'clock, you're early. Um, so that just worked. And I worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I had no work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the six weeks I was there. So I'm really good at, at kind of compartmentalizing, um, and and you know just getting that stuff done. It's awesome. Yeah, that that it's funny. I was in I was in a small island in. Greece over the summer called Sifnos and we met some Greek guys and they were talking about dinner. They're like, okay, we're going to get you on the real Greek schedule here. You need to have set, make your reservation for dinner at 1030 tonight. And, and then he's go to this restaurant. It's a wonderful place. And he's like, make sure you stay till the end though. Once you get to like 1am, then the chefs will come out and start drinking with you and making additional extra food. And then from there, you're probably around the right time that you might be able to go out to like some of the nightclubs. And, uh, and we saw them and they were just complete. It was like the next day after they did this at like 11 a.m. or maybe like noon. And they were just, <laughs> they looked like hell. Yeah, I don't, how <laughs> they were like, I don't know if we want to do this. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how they actually have lives because, because they actually go to work <laughs> in the morning too. It's crazy. And they, and they sleep on these full stomachs. It's, but, I <laughs> but I, I do it's love that they, I love that they spend time with their family and they spend time with their friends. They don't spend time at home watching television at nights. You know, they're, they're doing the important stuff. You, yeah, I'd much rather trade a long dinner than a uh, long time in front of the TV. Um, sure. Cameron, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you hopping on and talking with me. Uh, what is something, so if, uh, I know you're, you've got the, the program that you were talking about. Uh, what's, what is, a, where would you direct people if they want to learn more about what you're doing um, and things that, you know, if, if they, want, they want to get into your ecosystem, how should they do that? I, I would definitely encourage people to take a look at the Invest in Your Leaders. So it's investinyourleaders.com. Sign up, you know, one to three of your managers, one to five of your managers and grow people. That's one. All five of my books are available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. So if they just look up my name on Amazon, they'll see all five of my books there. And then the website, cameronherald.com or the COOalliance.com. And also check out the Second in Command podcast. You know, we only interview the COOs. We never interview the entrepreneur. Cool. Yeah. This has been awesome. Cameron, have a wonderful trip. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Austin. Looking forward to seeing you on the road, too.